practicals of the existing 2017 yes kundan you are saying something yes sir that's what i, I was saying sir, about practical yes until the seventh semester practicals are over they will not allow and now they have also can dg shipping has also cancelled that earlier order which from 33 percent they had brought it to 50 percent now this 50 percent is cancelled and we have gone back to 33 percent of the total number of boys that can come into the college for the practical training i think they are still doing it with 50 percent but the new order which has come out on i think uh, uh this month only 14 no, today's what today's the 9th 10th no, sorry today's the today's friday friday is april april today is the 10th sorry 9th today's the 9th it has come out i think on the 4th on the 6th i think it has come out the new order from dg shipping it is order number 14 of 2021 and they have asked us to go back to the original order which means 33 percent so when your batch is called for the program practical program only one third of the batch will be called not 50 percent like they had given a secondary order it's a mess it's a big mess it's a mess of orders DG shipping is also keeping on changing its orders depending on how many infections are taking place and Mumbai itself is in a bad state and in the process the 2017 NT batch they are also suffering they are not able to get the CDCs in time and the CDC is supposed to come from Mumbai they have got soft copy number etc but shipping companies want the actual hard copy Without the hard copy, you cannot proceed for your shipboard training. It's a big issue regarding uh, working in Mumbai. And Mumbai has become a very, very dangerous place to live in. Even the most secure people are also getting the infection. It is possibly there in Kolkata also, but it has been kept quiet. So I don't know what the real score is. Nobody knows what the real infection score is but it must be quite bad with so many people not wearing masks not maintaining social distancing and wherever it happens people keep it quiet they don't announce because they don't want to make a big show about it they don't want to suffer the issues but when it becomes very serious then they have to be hospitalized then your oxygen level drops then you have no choice but to go to the hospital so my advice to you is don't think that it cannot attack you. It can attack you. And some people are affected more than the others. So if it affects you and then you go through a bad time and then maybe you'll recover. But the damage is done. The permanent damage is possibly done already into your organs. So some part of the organ is damaged. It will show up much later. So it is better to prevent it then to try and cure it. Prevention is always better than cure. All right, we've got 39 boys and the total strength is 38. So this figure should be actually 40. So we still have 11 boys who are not yet coming in. Okay, so let me put it. I've already put it on record. So let me just put this down on record. Good morning. any girls in the, in the thing? I don't know. Anyway, I hope everybody is keeping in good health. That is primary. All the dollars in the world, all the money in the world is not worth it if your health is not in good order. Nothing in the world is worth it if you don't have good health. I can't impress upon this more than anything. It is so, so critical in today's world to have be in good health. There are 30 or 40 year old fellows who are getting heart attacks. I am shocked. I'm sure how the hell they're getting it, I don't know. Anyway, today's uh, class, what we have, is related to a very important chapter in your syllabus. And if you understand this part of the subject, you will definitely make very good engineers. 
So what we are going to discuss with is the lubrication system in the machinery. And it is not only related to lubrication of engines, but it is actually relevant to lubrication of all components, all machinery components. Wherever there is some rubbing and movement between two relative surfaces, there you need lubrication. Somebody has come. Kartavya Singh. Kartavya's uh, uh, email address is still not functional. Whatever emails I send, it backfires onto me. So I will not send any more emails to Kartavya Singh. Okay. So this particular chapter, I repeat, is a very, very important chapter. And we will try to do it with the objective of making you understand, not simply my delivering the subject and I'm done with. I will not have that. I will ensure that you understand every step, every point in the subject matter. So let us start. You know, 32 boys. Still, we have got eight boys who are missing. Eight candidates. Uh, this is section C. Section C, I think. Who does it? Paran Abdus Kundan Kumar. Kundan Kumar is there. Paran, are you there? Yes, yes sir. Okay, good. Okay. Basic lubrication of machinery. Now, understand it, absorb it. Don't let it be just a reading process. All machinery which have rubbing, rotating, and rolling contact surfaces require lubrication medium between them. Anywhere there is friction, our objective is to provide some medium which will reduce the friction. That is the basic of lubrication in machinery. Now, the lubricating oil in a machine unit, that means any machine unit, is akin to the blood system in a human body. For the machinery system to run satisfactorily, the lubricating oil has to be at the highest level of purity, cleanliness, and appropriate viscosity. Engine health conditions and faults can be traced, and impending issues can be diagnosed through lube oil analysis. Okay. Now consider your own system, your own body. You have blood flowing within yourself and uh, your health largely depends on the condition of the blood. Similarly, for an engine, the health of that engine largely depends on the lubricating oil that is within, inside. And that lubricating oil is circulating through that engine thoroughly. And that again, that oil, it gets dirty because some amount of carbon also comes in. There is some amount of wear and tear of the bearings. There is some amount of condensation of water from the atmosphere. So all these impurities, they come into that oil. And this oil cannot continue with all that dirtiness. It has to be cleaned. So it is passed through filters and purifiers. Just like your own body system, your blood is doing so much of functions for your organs and then it is cleaning your whole system. So now that blood needs to be cleaned. That blood in your body is already being cleaned by your kidneys. Your kidneys filter out all the impurities that are there and you discharge it as urine. Similarly, for an engine, you have kidneys. And these kidneys are actually your centrifuges, the purifiers which are running in conjunction with the engine. So the oil which is inside the crankcase is continuously fed into the engine and circulated. That means whatever oil goes for the function drops down at the bottom and then again that oil is taken and put back into the engine. Now there is a branch pipe from that tank which holds the oil to pass it through the kidney which is the centrifuge. So the centrifuge continuously cleans the oil and puts it back into the sump. So that is the whole idea about similarity between an engine and the human body. Your blood system and the lubricating oil system are similar. So now you will realize how important it is to keep that lubricating oil system in its top-notch form. It has to be in very good condition. That oil. If that oil is bad, the engine is going to fail. Without doubt, it will fail. All right. 
and while i am explaining to you i will give you a lot of information which is not directly related to the plates that are being presented to you but there is a lot of information which i will try to keep it interesting otherwise what happens is you tend to feel get bored too much of technical information coming at one load becomes very very difficult to absorb and at the same time becomes very bearing as it is we learnt in our fdp classes that the attention span of students is only 8 seconds after 8 seconds the mind tends to go elsewhere it's quite true and especially if the delivery is a little boring i will try to keep it as interesting as possible and at the same time keep tell you stories about chips what happens in the engine room due to some mistake and thing like that okay so in my last class one of the boys asked me sir isn't it possible that when take bunker of blue boil there is dirt inside absolutely no you see bunkering of fuel oil and diesel oil is completely different from bunker in blue boil blue boil will come if it comes in bulk it will come in the form of those trucks that you see those trucks which are carrying in our city you will see those tanker tanker lorries the tanker trucks so lube oil comes in that and about one truck is enough for one ship at any time other than this we have mostly got the lubricating oil on board in drums 200 liter drums 200 liter drums is quite big quite heavy but they give 30 40 drums at a time and they are kept on the deck and it is the engine crew who will unload those drums and put it into the pipes which are on the deck on the deck you do have your fuel oil and diesel oil bunkering platforms or flanges bunkering flanges you also have for lube oil which are sometimes flush with the deck and they have caps and these caps are made of bronze and these caps have to be opened out then you fit a funnel on it and you fit a funnel which is also threaded and then you use a chain block and a wire sling and you lift the drum the crew members do it officers don't do it they lift the drum and they slant the drum at an angle and pour one one drum into that funnel and it goes into the engine room there are separate storage tanks for lubricating oil these are not double bottom tank these are normal gravity tanks which are alongside your service tanks and the other tanks which are above the tank top much above in fact most of them are in the upper regions of the engine room because from there you allow it to drain into the respective sumps and tanks chatin okay 943 he's the last man 13 minutes is a long time so lubricating oil is a different different product which comes on the ship and the oil is absolutely clean it comes in sealed drums so do not expect any water any dirt any uh, vanadium or any cat, uh, cat finds or anything like that the oil is absolutely clean transparent golden color and it is like honey you must have seen what honey looks like when you buy a bottle of honey it looks exactly like honey and it's also thick like honey but they are very clean so i was pretty surprised that uh, a boy is asking what about the impurities in the lube oil when we bunker very good that he asked me the lubricating oil that comes on board is absolutely clean it will not be dirty at all okay shitish has got a question sir in tanker or cargo ship how much fuel is stored for running of ship oh that's a nice question all right i'll answer your question it largely depends on the size of the ship it can carry 2000 tons it can carry 500 tons it is dependent on the ship now the ships that we car we marine engineers work on they generally carry anything between uh, 1000 and 2000 maybe the very large cargo ship will carry 2500 tons not liters tons of oil as fuel oil so the diesel oil will be much less the fuel oil will be much more because diesel oil is much more costly and it has got very limited use with the objective of minimizing expenditures 
So heavy oil can be anything up to 2,000 tons. Diesel oil can be anything up to 200 times 200 tons to say 400 tons, maybe 500 tons is the maximum for a very large ship, but not much, not much compared to heavy oil. Heavy oil will have huge amount. It depends on the size of the ship. Lube oil also depends on the size of the ship. And uh, there is something more I need to tell you that when you go on the ship inside your cabin, on the door, on the back side of the door, there will be a chart. The previous engineers have already maintained those charts and they, when they go, they leave those charts there for the next engineer to follow up on. Now on that list, you will see there are a number of different lubricating oils. There are about 15 to 20 different lubricating media, that means lubricating oil, greases, all are there. And each one is for a different purpose altogether. You cannot use the oil that you are using for main engine, for generator. For generator oil, you cannot use for compressor. Compressor oil, you cannot use for steering gear. Steering gear for your purifier, purifier for your turbocharger. You cannot intermix or change the oil that is being used. Now, who is this fellow? Let come out. Mrittanjoy Das. He is another champion. I am not going to allow him. Okay, let him come. Okay, I denied him. Okay, so um, what I was saying, so when you see that chart, you will see different types of oils for different machines. Main engine oil is different, turbocharger oil is different, your auxiliary engine oil is different, purifier oil is different, steering gear is different, windlass is different. So each oil has a designation, what it has to be used for. So accordingly, we have different tanks, multiple number of lubricating oil tanks. Of course, each is of a different size. And this oil has to be correctly chosen for the purpose it is being used. Oh, please don't trouble me if I don't admit him. Okay, let him come in. So for each machine, you have a different type of oil. Why? Next question is why? If you remember, I had told you about hydrodynamic lubrication and this hydrodynamic lubrication what were the four parameters that were necessary one was the speed of the ship uh, speed of the shaft one was the load on the shaft right one was the viscosity viscosity load speed and clearance clearance viscosity is the most important parameter of any oil, lubricating oil. Now, this bearing which is designed by a designer, he also specifies the lubricating oil that is to be used for that bearing. And those are based on calculations regarding speed of the shaft that rotates, the surface area on which it is in contact, the load which is it is supposed to be bearing, the material of the two surfaces which have been used. So all these factors decide the quality of lubricating oil that is to be used. The viscosity being the prime consideration. There are other parameters also, but viscosity is the most important factor or property of a lubricating oil. Okay? So, you cannot intermix oils from one machine to another. That is why it is the engineer who is responsible when there is an oil change or oil transfer or oil replacement. But the engineer has to be there. You do not put the responsibility to an oil man or at a motor man. He will pick any oil and he will put it in there. And then when the bearing fails, you say, oh, it's very poor quality oil. That is not the point. The point is you have used the wrong grade of oil. That is very, very important. Okay. Now, what does the lubricating oil do? So, let's see. What are the principal functions of the engine lubricant? And they are as follows. Uh, Shitesh, I hope you got your uh, information regarding how much fuel is stored. It depends on the ship and it can be anything from 500 tons to 2,000, 2,500 tons of heavy oil. Diesel oil will be anything like 100 tons 
to 400 tons. I don't think anything more than 400 tons. But today, today's regulations, which says you must carry oil, which must not be more than 0.5% sulfur. All right. And now, if your ship is bound for Europe or emission controlled areas, you must also have a separate tank which will have 0.1% sulfur. The 0.1% sulfur fuel oil will be more costly than the 0.5% sulfur. So, and that 0.1% fuel will be used only when the ship is in European waters, North Atlantic, California, and there are designated places which are called emission controlled areas. There is quite a list of it. And gradually that list is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The only place that doesn't seem to be a area which is restricted is the Indian Ocean. Everybody throws whatever he feels like in the Indian Ocean, Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean. But in time, all these are also going to become emission. As it is, it has already become. You're not allowed to use fuel oil with 3.5% sulfur. So it has already become and it is going to become more and more and more stringent regarding air pollution and water pollution both so now you need to have two different tanks for heavy oil two different tanks for diesel oil very very strange it is you have to have fuels which have got 0.5 percent and you have to have fuels which have got 0.1 percent of course the 0.1 percent tanks will be much smaller Ships have a number of tanks on board. Double bottom tanks are all subdivided and it's quite a plan. When you go on the ship, the first thing, try to understand the ship, the plan of the ship. Which tank is for what? There are so many tanks. There may be 30, 40 tanks. So there are ballast water tanks, there are fuel tanks, there are lube oil tanks, there are fresh water tanks. There are so many different tanks, wing tanks. To understand the ship's plan very well before you start working on the ship. So now, that's all. It's become more complicated for you because you need to have oil which has got 0.5% sulfur and then some other tank which has got 0.1% uh, oil. And this is not enough. Why? Because, okay, we'll come to that later because I have not yet explained to you that particular part of lubricating oil. For the 0.5%, one lubricating oil will be used. For 0.1%, a different lubricating oil has to be used. So that is also a big catch. So we will come into these step by step. Let's have a look at the principal functions of an engine lubricant. Okay, before I show you the page, everybody think the principal function, what can it be? To reduce friction. But you as an engineer, you will need to know more than that. Much, much more than that. There are seven different functions which can be categorized as the most important functions for a lubricating oil. All right. The first lesson that you learned is that a lubricating oil within a machine is much like your blood system. You keep it in good health, the engine will be in good health. All right. Now let's have a look at the principal functions of the engine lubricant. All right. Basic functions of a lubricant. Number one is lubrication, which means provide a film between moving parts and thereby reduce frictional resistance. Otherwise, too much of power will be consumed by the engine to move the engine. It's quite difficult. So you will get very little power from the shaft if most of the power from the fuel is used to move the parts of the engine. So you must have minimum friction within the engine, which is reflected as mechanical efficiency all right okay second factor is cooling wherever the restriction no matter how little it is there will be heat generation so the lubricating oil functions as a heat transfer medium or media it removes and dissipates the heat chances generated within that bearing or within that component where there is rubbing action okay and in my earlier class on C trials, I had also told you that the engine is programmed such that if any lube oil pressure drops, 
the engine will slow down or shut down depending on the pressure drop. I told you that if the pressure drops from 4 bar, let us say, from 4 bar to 3 bar, the engine will slow down automatically. The engineer does not need to take action. It will take action on its own. So why does it happen? Why should it slow down? It has dropped from 4 to 3 bar. One of the functions is the lube oil that you're sending to that bearing is apart from reducing friction, it also provides cooling. Now, if the pressure drops from 4 bar to 3 bar, then the quantity of oil going to that bearing is also reduced. So the rate of heat dissipation is also reduced. In other words, if you continue at the same speed with the reduced fuel lube oil pressure, that bearing is going to get heated more and more and more and more. And ultimately, you'll have a bearing failure. So it is all programmed that if there is a lube oil pressure drop, engine will slow down. If there's a cooling water pressure drop, engine will also stop, slow down. If the pressure drop from 3 bar to 2 bar, engine will shut down. Why? Because at 2 bar, it is not enough to provide adequate lubrication or cooling to reach all the parts of the engine where lube oil is required. All right. So that is why you will need to have a safety arrangement. So the important functions are lubrication. Next is cooling. A third function is also as important, and that is filling in uneven surfaces. For example, between piston ring and liner. The, when the ring is fitted in the piston and it is entirely lowered into the liner, the piston does not make any contact with the cylinder liner walls. No. It is the piston rings that make contact with the cylinder liner walls. Now, these piston rings, they are, you know, almost elastic. They have to be compressed and then lowered into the liner. So when it opens out inside the liner, it creates a force against the liner walls. And that force is not altogether even in the entire circumference. So there are places where there is making contact. There are places where it is not making contact. Not making contact does not mean big gap. It means some fraction of a millimeter clearance. Now, this clearance could allow the air to pass through. Air can pass through. So much so, when the engine tries to compress, good amount of air will leak past the piston rings. To prevent this or to stop this, you have lubricating oil, which is on the cylinder liner wall, and it will fill in these small, tiny gaps. And believe me, the sealing effect is so good, so good, that the integrity of the combustion chamber is almost as good as 100%. No leakages. So when actual compression takes place, it is compressing to 100% efficiency. I learned this lesson in practice on board the ship. I, as a junior engineer, 5th engineer, I was told, all right, Pukaji, you go up and try out the lifeboat engine. Every Saturday, we are expected to try out the lifeboat engine, which is a small engine. And that time, there was no battery start. It was all handomatic. We had to use a crank lever, rotate the engine, and drop the unloaders. Okay. So I kept trying, kept trying. It wouldn't start. The engine wouldn't start. Just wouldn't start. Then, totally, boiler suit is totally wet with sweat. So then I learned my lesson from this engine room wiper. He's a cleaner, but he has got years of experience. So he went down to the engine room. And he came up with a lube oil can and some spanners. So he helped in opening up the fuel injector. And then he put that can nozzle into the fuel injector passage. And he squirted oil all around the piston edge. So the oil from the piston edge went down along the liner and filled up the spaces between the ring and the liner. So after that, he put back the fuel injector and we started on the first shot the engine started. So that is so effective in maintaining the integrity of the combustion chamber. So if your engine is not starting, add a little lube oil or activate the lubricating oil lubricators. These lubricators on the main engine, they will have a handle and they allow 
manual injection of lube oil apart from self injection by the engine we generally do that when we are maneuvering because during maneuvering we need to stop and start without fail so we inject a little more of lubricating oil to ensure that the gaps between the rings and the piston and the rings and the liner are filled with the oil to provide the sealing effect this sealing effect is very very relevant very important and i know because i had to sweat it out for it okay at my junior level when i just joined ship the next is cleaning now all this debris which comes into the engines suppose you have some amount of carbon coming from your past blow past from your piston engine come there some amount of ash which comes from burning fuel oil that will also come into the spaces so it will it is only going to accumulate inside the engine this lubricating oil has the function of removing the dirt removing the carbon and the debris from settling and holding the contaminants in suspension that means the dirt which comes off from the various places are held in that lubricating oil that means that lubricating oil is now dirty because the dirt has come into the lube oil and it is moving around so the the property of that oil to clean is called detergency you must be using household detergents to clean your clothes that is like a soap so this property is built into the lubricating oil by adding certain chemicals so it has got a cleaning property apart from cleaning it is also capable of holding the contaminants in suspension which means the dirt which comes off from the surface remains with the oil it doesn't go and settle down again it remains with the oil all right so this is the cleaning property of the lubricating oil the first second third fourth fifth property is your dampening and cushioning you see when a shaft or a component inside the engine is rotating in the bearing it means there is a clearance between the shaft and the bearing and the whole engine is vibrating it means the two components will be impacting against each other because they have a clearance between them so the engine is vibrating means there will be vibrating inside to have impacting forces and the damage that is caused on the surface of the bearing is sometimes turned uh, is termed as brinelling brinelling is hammering and tapping and making marks on the surface dents caused out of impacting forces arising out of vibration this is called brinelling and sometimes you will hear about brinelling brinelling of bearings b r i n e l l i n g brinelling you might have learned about brinel brinelling brinel number hardness number vickers hardness test brinel's hardness test these are all surfaces which have a testing procedure for the surface testing anyway so dampening and cushioning so to avoid that impacting between two for surfaces which have a clearance you have lubricating oil so that lubricating oil in between the two surfaces provide some amount of dampening and cushioning of components under vibration induced stress all right i think it's reasonably easy to understand if you don't understand put it down on the chat column and i will definitely clear your doubts next is protection protection from oxidation and corrosion which means rusting basically if you have a steel plate out in the open atmosphere it will start rusting but if you have a layer of oil on it then it doesn't rust so the oil which is continuously coating the internal surfaces of the engine eliminates any chance of any rust formation from the part everything is made of steel inside so steel has every opportunity to get rusted it's the most easily oxidizable metal 
the brass bronze gun metal titanium silver they don't get oxidized so easily as much as iron does iron has lot of strength much more than most other metal but it is very prone to corrosion rusting so that is why lubricating oil has a very good effect of protection from oxidation and corrosion there is another huge property of the lubricating oil and metal metal i mean largely steel or iron or forged steel or cast iron any of the iron family body has an affinity for lubricating oil this affinity means there is strong amount of adhesiveness between the lube oil and the steel if you throw oil on a plate of steel and you wipe it off does all the oil go it doesn't go but if you throw water on a clean steel and wipe it off it is clean there water doesn't hold on the surface but oil has the tenacity to adhere to the surface so this adhesive property of the lubricating oil is enormously beneficial in our operating the engines okay so that is why this protection from oxidation and corrosion is based on the property of the lube oil having adhesive property what is acid corrosion corrosion arising out of acid if you have acid on a metal surface it will corrode the surface why it forms a electrolytic cell on the surface so you are uh, uh, acid corrosion if you throw acid on a surface it corrodes that is acid corrosion it, oxidation is the effect of oxygen having effect on that and it is oxidizing that is quite different from your acid corrosion any acid you pour on a surface it corrodes that surface similarly your cylinder liner it gets acid corrosion in spite of having oil on it so you need alkali to have to neutralize the acid okay we are coming to this just now so after protection the seventh property or seventh benefit is transportation or transporting i told you this holding the contaminants in suspension means that the dirt remains with the oil and this oil when it is pumped out from the engine and passed through the filters and the centrifuges the dirt is removed so what comes out is clean oil and this clean oil is again sent into the engine for the lubrication okay the property of cleaning is called detergency and the property of holding the contaminant in suspension is called dispersency and write it down on a piece of paper as a short note detergency and dispersency go together you need them together because if it just cleans and then again lets it drop over there the whole purpose is lost something like a municipality you see they clean those drains underground by removing the manhole cover and they let the muck remain right beside it and they put back the cover then one rain shower it goes back into the system so there is detergency but no dispersency with the municipality so dispersency and detergency have to go hand in hand together that means if it is cleaned the cleaned products that means the dirt which has been cleaned out has to be removed that is called dispersency the ability to hold that dirt within the oil is called dispersency okay so now you understand there are seven different procedures the seven different functions of the lubricating oil okay let's go on to the next part <clears throat> once you know what are the functions of the lubricating oil next part of your understanding lubricating oil is like an engineer how do you handle it what is the best practice how do you deal with the oil so there are three basic principles for dealing with lubricating oils and lubricants all of them okay okay let's go on to the next chapter next pamphlet see there are three good practices in machinery lubricant handling or dealing with lubricating oils one thing is you must understand that 
lubricating oil is five times more costly. Okay, for an dampening and cushioning. All right. In any machine, if there is a moving part within the machine, it means there is a clearance between the holding part and the moving part. Okay. Now, while it is moving and the whole machine is vibrating. It means there is a possibility of that free or the loose part hammering against the surface which it is being held in. All right. But if you have a lubricating oil between the two surfaces, then that lubricating oil provides for some amount of damping. It does not have impacting forces with metal to metal contact. But you must maintain that oil pressure to ensure that there is a film of oil between the two surfaces. That is one of the reasons why clearances have their limit. If you have a very large clearance, the whole thing is going to simply be hammering if the whole thing vibrates. That is why transporting of machines is a complex process. It is not simple. It is not simple to simply load one engine on a truck and transport it. No. It causes a lot of problems. Why? Because the components within that engine does not have the lubricating oil running between the surfaces. Because that machine has stopped. That machine has stopped. It is not running. So there is no lubricating oil between the two surfaces. And your truck is carrying that machine over the potholed roads of our country. The whole machine is shaking. So what happens? The machine housing is shaking the component is shaking inside the housing. So there is some amount of impacting and this impacting causes damage on those bearings. And this damage is called brinelling. Just now I explained to you. You understand? So transporting a machine is not a simple process. You will cause damage to that machine if you transport it without any cushions at the bottom to minimize the vibration when it is being transported. I hope you are able to understand my point. Yes, good, Farhan. So, transporting any machine, any machine, which has got a moving component inside, it will be damaged. So much so, even a car, you see behind. But of course, car is resting on the, what do you call, on the tires, it's got shock absorbers. So, it doesn't make so much of a difference. But a late machine, a simple machine, which is a diesel engine, let us say, a simple diesel engine, it is loaded on the truck and it is transported, it is already getting damaged. That is the way the things are. So, sometimes some, some of these foreign companies, what they do, they inject a very thick lubricating oil, very thick lubricating oil, and they are under pressure. So, all the surfaces have a layer of oil between them. How much it helps, it depends on how much vibration it is subjected to. Okay, so let's move on. The three good practices that you will need to follow on board the ship. Number one, correct choice of a lubricating oil or lubricant for the work it is intended. That means your main engine crankcase must get the correct grade of oil. That means the viscosity of that oil has to be correct. The other associated properties, how much temperature it can sustain, whether it has some detergency in it, whether it has some dispersants in it, all these parameters are built into the oil. And whether we are going to use that oil or you use the turbocharger oil. If you use the turbocharger oil, all your bearings are going to get damaged. I had told you in that hydrodynamic lubrication, the four important parameters. Three of them are standard. The clearance, okay, you maintain clearance, fine. The speed, that is determined by the engine manufacturer. You cannot do much about that. And the load, all right, that is also, it is has a limit to how much load that penny. The most important part where you play a role is the viscosity of the lubricating oil that you're going to pour inside. If this viscosity is not correct, no matter how good your machine is, it will get damaged. That's it. It will get damaged. 
so you have to choose the correct lubricating oil okay next is the rate at which the oil is fed in each of these bearings you see the main bearing which get the oil they go through a particular diameter pipe and the pump pressure is also within limits of 4 to 6 bar so based on the pressure and the diameter of the pipe and of course the viscosity the oil quantity will go correct to that particular bearing if you have too much of oil on it it is going to churn the oil and generate more heat and in the process that extra heat will cause oxidation of that lubricating oil faster it will damage the lube oil and in the process damage the bearing also so the correct rate of oil is very necessary too much is oil is as detrimental as too little okay that is why most of these bearings pedestal bearings plumber block bearing shaft bearings they have a little gauge glass with them or they have a dip tube dipstick even in your car you might have seen when they open up they take out that dipstick to see how much oil is there and on that dipstick you will see a low level marking and a high level marking you are expected to maintain the level between these two markings above the high level marking is going to damage your engine it will start coming out from all the other places because it cannot contain so much of oil so you must keep it within the specific amount and this specific level is intended for satisfactory quantity of oil delivery to the respective bearing or to the point where there is rubbing action all right so the first one was correct choice of the lubricating oil that means the viscosity grade for main engine it has to be this for auxiliary engine it has to be this for lube oil purifier it has to be this for compressor it has to be this oil for governor it has to be that oil so these oils are distinctive you cannot interchange the oils from one machine to another so this has to be well understood and the second one of course that the quantity of oil you give also has to be correct okay these are two important practices the third practice is your blood test you see you can tell the doctor i am not feeling well and the doctor says he doesn't know look at you you look quite fine but he will say okay get a blood test done for this 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 so you go you get a blood test done then he sees the report and he said yes you have some infection in you your blood shows that it has got certain infection how does he do that test he does the test because you complain to him you tell him that you are not feeling well but an engine it cannot tell you that it is not feeling well so what we do on the ship is every month that is periodic checking testing analysis of the used oil to determine not only the illness but also the loss in characteristics as compared to the new oil right and assess if the oil can continue in service or requires to be changed it can further diagnose several faults within the engine let's write it down it also diagnose the why should i use big word it also finds faults faults within i don't want to use big words it also finds faults within the engine that means the test report it will tell you whether your cam and roller are getting worn out very fast it will tell you whether your piston rings or liners are getting worn out very fast because every 10 days you cannot take out piston and measure the liner no only a continuous monitoring of the lubricating oil will tell you how much metal is getting worn out and there are limitations to how much metal can be worn out Okay, and the worrying part is if there is iron particles found in that lubricating oil. White metal, little bit understandable. There can be little white metal because the shaft is resting in a white metal bearing, and the shaft itself is forged steel, very hard. Whereas the white metal is a softer metal, so 
So between the two, it is likely that the white metal small particles will come out. But the steel coming out means something is wrong, something seriously wrong. Steel will come out from parts where steel to steel contact or rubbing action is there. And there, if the lubricating system fails, then definitely that iron particles will come out. The, which are the metal or iron to iron contact surfaces, piston ring and liner? Okay. Apart from that, you will have tappet, valve, and rocker arm. That is metal to that means iron to iron. Okay. Then you will have uh, sprocket wheel. The sprocket wheel which is running the chain, both are made of steel. That will be one place. Then there are gear wheels. The gear wheels have their teeth, which is iron to iron contact. So from the gear wheels, you can get parts of particles of iron. Apart from this, the camshaft, cam and roller, both are high grade steel. But if the lubricating oil is not there, it is going to fail. And you will get particles of lubricating oil, uh, particles of iron in the lube oil. So getting iron particles is an alarming system alarming situation why because it is not supposed to wear you're supposed to put adequate lubricating oil and the film of oil between the two should be full film lubrication not boundary lubrication i wonder if i've already taught you this boundary lubrication full film lubrication i think i've done it somewhere or maybe the previous batch okay Okay, so periodic checking, testing, analysis of the loop or used oil to determine the loss of characteristics as compared to the new oil and assess if the oil can continue to be in service or requires to be changed. It also finds faults within the engine. Okay, that means that oil, when you send it to the laboratory, they will tell you whether you need to change the oil fully or partly. And also, they will tell you what are the products found in the lube oil. How will they decide if the lube oil is to be changed? Well, first thing is if there is a viscosity change. In time, if there is no fuel oil going in, the tendency of the lube oil is to get thicker, thicker and thicker. Why? Why does the oil get thicker? The, the lube oil is subjected to high temperature. Okay. When you heat oil, you will get oil vapor. When you do cooking in the kitchen and you pour that oil in your kadai, you will find vapor coming out. So it is the volatile constituents of the oil that are leaving the oil. So the volatile constituents make for thinner viscosity. And once they go out, the oil starts getting thicker. And this condition is called oil thickening. Oil thickening is also a term used or lubricating oil and it happens and if that oil viscosity increases like this up to a certain level you can still use it then i think it is 25 percent plus or minus of the original value that the oil can be used and if it goes beyond that limit you will need to change if diesel oil happens to get into the lube oil then the viscosity is going to drop it drops very severely and up to 25 percent drop it can still be used but what happens is the fuel oil oxidizes the lubricating oil and the lubricity property of that oil gets damaged so when you have you can smell you can smell the oil and tell whether it has been contaminated heavy oil has a very distinctive smell lube oil has a very distinctive smell diesel oil has a different smell and all the oils, after a few years of experience, you will be able to tell which oil is leaking somewhere. You will get the smell and you will be able to tell whether it is lube oil leaking from somewhere or is it heavy oil leaking or is it diesel oil. You might be sitting in the control room, your sense of smell also improves. It improves and in fact, the engine running, you will be able to diagnose by the smell also. There is a certain burning smell that comes in its normal condition or overheated metal. It has a different smell. And if that thing goes wrong, you will get the smell before what, what you see. And your 
sense of smell will become honed after one two years of staying in the engine room it is inevitable you will be able to tell similarly on board the ship everybody's nose is very very sensitive to fire if there is the tiniest trace of burning smell everybody jumps because you see the ship is like a trap if there is a fire there is no way to run away you will burn to death so even the slightest trace of fire you get up immediately and look for the place where the smell is coming without fail okay nazir nazir is a question sir what is the relation of thickness of oil to the viscosity of oil thickness is just a layman's term viscosity is the technical term it means the same it means the same how thick the oil is means how viscous the oil is right in layman's term we call it thick oil and in an engineer's term you will call it viscous oil at all okay if you know a lot of people don't understand what is viscosity viscosity is a technical term but to make it easy we use thickness so like honey is very thick but milk is very thin what does it mean I mean honey is much more viscous and milk is less viscous yes of course the thickness will decrease if you say when you heat the oil it will decrease but if you heat it where the fumes are coming out over a period of time what will happen it will become thicker when that oil again cools it will be very thick all right when that oil after heating volatile it goes out it becomes thin but again when it cools it will be thicker than the original amount what it was or rather it will be more viscous than what it was earlier but on board the ship you will not have so much of oil thickening problems the thickening happens mostly in automobile oils not so much in the engine marine engine oils the oil thickening won't be there in fact the problem lies in thinning it becomes thinner how sometimes the diesel oil leaks into the lube oil from where if you see mainly it happens with the auxiliary engines not so much with the main engine the auxiliary engines the rocker arm is lubricated with the lubricating oil from the crankcase same oil now at the rocker arm region you also have the fuel injector and this fuel injector has a fuel pipe coming from the fuel pump and over repeated opening and closing that nut of the pipe from the fuel injector because you regularly need to remove the injector for pressure testing then you put it back again you tighten that surface that pipe at that nozzle tip where the nut holds becomes work hardened you understand what is work hardening i'll give you an example of what is work hardening if you have a hammer a new hammer a brand new hammer and you have a old hammer which has been used for few years and the surfaces of hammering which one will be harder one will definitely be harder and one will be softer obviously the old hammer will be having a much harder surface why because it has been work hardened now what is work hardened i could explain to you but it will take a lot of time it is something to do with the crystalline structure of that metal at the surface where impact forces have taken place but write a note on a piece of paper beside you what is work hardening of metals okay so but so we studied that when oil thing yeah 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 it's right viscosity will definitely become thin when it is heated and during that heated time the vapors will go out all right it is still thin but when it cooled it will become more viscous than what it was originally okay nadir you get the point okay thank you okay now let's go on to our next part so you have learned two things one is what is the function 
of the lubricating oil. So there are seven functions. And what are the good practices in dealing with lubricating oil? Correct choice, correct amount, and testing, checking of the quality of the lube oil or blood test of the lubricating oil. Where is the arrow? Okay. Next. Now let us go on to specifics. Let us go on to the specifics on main engine. The main engine is a two-stroke engine and there will be three different oils used for that main engine. The first one is the main system lubrication inside the crankcase. This oil lubricates the crosshead bearing, bottom end bearing, main bearing, guide and guide shoe and the link rods that is inside the engine. All the moving parts, the chain drive, the gear drive for the camshaft, the camshaft, the rocker arm, sorry, the cam and roller, these are all lubricated by the main engine system lube oil. Okay. Uh, okay. This is one part of the lubrication. Second one is the cylinder lubrication. The oil that is between the piston rings and the cylinder liner is completely a different lubricating oil. And it is the most expensive, not the most, I will say it is the second most expensive oil on board the ship. The cylinder oil, once it is used, it is used. You cannot reuse cylinder oil. So whatever oil gets in for lubricating of the cylinder liner and it falls to the bottom, the excess oil will fall to the bottom, is drained off into the sludge tank and it cannot ever be used again. All right. It is a one-time use oil and it is a very costly oil. So engineers are very cautious about consuming cylinder lubricating oil to a large extent. It should be very, very specific. We will go in depth with cylinder lubrication. Now, remember, it is an oil which is completely different from the main system oil. And it is much thicker in property. It has got chemicals in it. And it has got a different function as compared to the system lubricating oils. Okay. The third one is miscellaneous areas such as the governor. See, the governor is rotating at a much higher speed than any of the main engine parts. So it requires a thinner oil. And the thumb rule is, faster the speed between the surfaces, thinner the oil the, it has to be. If it is a slow moving surface, the oil can afford to be thicker. Okay. This, I think, is very basic. Because the, by the time the shaft draws the oil, if the oil is very thin, it will get squeezed out from the sides. So the oil will not reach the required design, designated place. But if the shaft is moving very fast, the oil before it can get squeezed out is drawn in and it provides the lubrication. So your turbocharger lubricating oil is sometimes thinner. But there are times when they use journal bearings. You know the difference between journal bearings and ball bearings and roller bearings. Ball bearings and roller bearings, they will require a thinner oil than what the main engine journal bearings are using. So, the brown Burberry turbochargers which are using bearings, which are ball bearings or roller bearings, they will have their own oil contained inside that uh, housing of the turbocharger. So, you need to change that oil every 500 hours or 1000 hours as specified by the manufacturer. So it is a different oil altogether. Then your turning gear, your turning gear may use the same oil as the main engine. It may use a different oil from the turning gear in main engine. It may use only grease. It all depends on the design of that turning gear. And the turning gear is not exactly a part of the engine. It is a part outside the engine. But it is okay. You associate it with the engine because it helps to turn the main engine. That's the way it is. So your governor will have different oil. Your uh, turbocharger may have different oil. Your thrust bearing may have different oil. But I think it is the same oil as the main engine in some engines. In some, they have a separate oil system, separate cooling arrangement for the thrust bearings. Thrust bearing is also not really a part of the main engine. So it can have a separate 
lubricating oil. Okay. So any questions? Ask. Next is a long chapter. Okay, Farhan has. Do all these different oils are from different manufacturers or they are extracted from the same little oil? Oh, you see, when I when we were discussing oils, you remember the distillation column. All of them are coming from crude oil. Crude oil makes also lube oil. Only that the oil that is distilled out goes through a saponification process which is a much more complicated process than the other. And that is why lubricating oils are much more costly. And this saponification process is another refining process where the oil is produced as lubricating oil. It has certain viscosity. And again, further processing can give different lubricating oils with different viscosity, different grades of viscosity. It is a complete science altogether. The process of making lubricating oils of various grades, various viscosities, various properties is a different technology altogether. And with research, we are improving our quality of lubricating oils in line with improving the design of the machinery. Understand one thing, that no matter how well you design your engine, if the lubricating oil does not match or suit that machine, the whole design of the machine is useless. You need to match a lubricating oil for the machine that you design. They must go hand in hand together. Improvement of the machine or you need the improvement of the lubricating oil also. So today's lubricants are very advanced, very, very advanced. They can sustain heavy loads. They can sustain very high temperatures. They can do miracles. Miracles. You don't need to change the oil. It's so good, so advanced. I was telling you, cylinder oil is the second costliest. Which is the costliest? The compressor oil. Why? The compressor oil is synthetic oil. Why we use synthetic oil for the compressor when you can use ordinary mineral oil? I will tell you later. Ultimately, everything boils down to cost. Though that oil is very costly, not using that oil, using mineral oil, which is much, much cheaper, ultimately becomes much, much costlier. That is why. Okay. Okay. Now let's go on to our next plate. Okay, Farhan, have you got it? All the lube oils come from crude oil. Yes, it is extracted from the same source. Sir, can we use the same lubricating? One sec. Can we use the same lubrication oil for piston assembly and tank case? Tank case, sir. If not, then there is a confusion about that. Okay, okay. Now you see on top right hand corner what is written two stroke. The cylinder oil for a two stroke engine is different from the crankcase oil. For the four stroke, the crankcase oil can be good, very good that you asked. Now it is clear for all the students. For the main, for the crank, for the four-stroke engine, it is a crankcase oil that is splashed inside the crankcase, which splashes onto the cylinder liner, and then on the piston you have compression rings and you have one scraper ring. That oil scraper ring will scrape off the excess oil and leave some trace of oil on the surface for the compression rings to rub on. Just now I explained to you that lubricating oil has, uh, or in fact any oil, has an adhesive property with steel. It sticks to the surface. Even if you wipe off, there will still be some oil on it. All right. So in the case of your cylinder lubrication, even after the piston ring scrapes off the oil, there is still some oil. And that oil is enough to lubricate the top two or three piston rings. Okay. Okay. Good that you asked. So now you're clear that two stroke cylinder lubrication is different. Four stroke cylinder lubrication is different. Okay. Okay. Now that is why blow past in four stroke engines is much more common. And that is why 
you need to change the crankcase oil of four stroke engine after a stipulated period no matter what the manufacturer will tell you after 3000 hours the crankcase oil has to be changed that means you remove the entire oil you discard it i mean you discard it in drums or you burn it off in as an incinerator but that also causes pollution now the rules have become very tight and you are not expected to burn that oil i will tell you something more very relevant what is happening on ships and which is now banned you have to be very careful about it but get this clear nazir that for four stroke engine the crankcase oil is used for cylinder lubrication and in the two stroke engine separate oil okay now i will ask you a question which you have to answer okay now that it is very clear to you everybody rides bikes i have asked this to the other sections and they were able to answer it i expect you also to answer it are you riding all of you there must be lot of you who are riding bikes motorbikes or scooters now i'm not talking about electric scooters okay all right now how do you know it is a two stroke bike or a four stroke bike or rather two stroke engine or a four stroke engine that the bike is using how do you know anybody paran sir in the exhaust there will be loop, uh, it will be oily because it is a two stroke engine because uh, because so of the loop oil being the two stroke will be oily at the exhaust or yes, four sir. stroke a four stroke will be oily ah see you are not very two sure stroke. four stroke will be oily right no sir two stroke two. will be oily sir no two stroke <laughs> make up your mind don't guess if you don't know say it doesn't matter this is just a class this is not an exam so which one will be wet the two stroke or four stroke the two stroke sir, the two stroke okay right why will the two stroke be wet the area of tom because of the cylinder lubrication procedure in the case of the four stroke the oil is scraped off and a trace of oil is on the surface which does not burn out with the exhaust gases so what is coming out from the exhaust gases is only carbon dry carbon so this dry carbon is ultimately settling down on the internal pipes of the exhaust pipe so when you go to college next time or when you see a bike you go and see kd motorbike he uses a bullet no so you put your finger on that exhaust pipe and you see it will be dry carbon okay and in i think now most of the bikes are all four stroke so if you put your finger on any of the exhaust pipes you will find it is got dry carbon but in a two stroke motorbike what do you do when the petrol tank you put mobile sometime 2t it is called 2t and they are selling in sachets packets you that fellow in the motor, in the petrol pump will cut the sachet and he'll empty it out and squeeze that packet to allow the thick lubricating oil to go into your petrol tank and then he fills up the petrol so the petrol and that lubricating oil are mixed together the purpose of the petrol is to burn and provide the power and the purpose of the lube oil that is 2t is to lubricate the piston and rings when it comes as a mixture with the petrol into the combustion spaces so the lube oil does not burn lube oil coats the surface of the liner and the rings and partly the piston crown and only part of it burns the remaining of it goes out as vapor and it goes on to the internal walls of the exhaust piping right up to the exhaust and some of it goes out also so that is why the two stroke engine is considered as a bigger polluting machine as compared to the four stroke all right so the lubrication principle of a two stroke being what it is renders the exhaust pipe wet with some amount of the condensed oil vapor which burns partially during the exhaust stroke and partially settles on the surface but there is some amount of carbon also being generated if the combustion process is not 100% and it is never 100% so some amount of carbon which that form sticks to that oil 
and you will get a wet carbon surface on your finger when you take a side so sample I, and only marine engineers are able to tell you ask an ordinary fellow ordinary engineer or hey are you riding a two stroke or four stroke he doesn't know he will tell you four stroke why because the dealer told him but he can't prove it to you over there if it is a two stroke or four stroke but a marine engineer will be able to prove it that this is a four stroke then you show him that see this is wet it's a two stroke engine you how does it say it is two stroke then you explain to him how the lubricating principle of the pis of the uh, cylinder liner and piston is in the case of two stroke and how it is in the case of a four stroke in the four stroke you have splashed lubrication from the crankcase and that splashed oil which is coming on the liner is a lot of oil but the scraper ring helps to scrape it down and keep only a trace of oil on the surface which enables the top piston rings to help in lubricating between the surfaces okay i hope it is reasonably clear so now we have only 15 minutes i have to finish this diagram also okay next plate is a little long but let us read it gradually and i will explain to you also and for the next plate after this is a diagram and that diagram i will take separately from my uh, desktop and then show it because it can show a bigger diagram so let's read this through the main engine lubricating oil system refer to the diagram we'll come to the diagram let's make a preliminary reading and then the diagram becomes a little easier the main and crankcase lubricant the main or crankcase lubrication system is supplied by one or two helical gear pumps not ordinary gear pumps which are used in auxiliary engines they are long helical gear pumps they got three spindles the central spindle is the one rotated by the motor and the other two spindles follow and one side is in suction the other side is discharge and a large quantity of oil can be pumped through the diameter of the lube oil pipe is about 1 foot for a big engine it's about 1 foot so that quantity of oil has to pass through so you need a large pump also so one of which will be operating and the other is on standby and these are set for automatic cutting should there be an a lubricating oil pressure reduction or primary pump failure there are always two pumps for all the system whether it is piston cooling jacket jacket cooling lubricating oil fire uh, ballast pump sea water pump nozzle cooling water pump each of them have got two two pumps each and they are always programmed that if one fails the other will start automatically so at no time will it be that the engine does not get oil okay of course moment one pump fails the other alarm will come alarm will come to the control room and the engineer is supposed to go and check why it has failed so the reasons of failure can be so many okay the main lube oil pump take their suction from the main engine sump tank and discharge oil via the main engine main lube oil cooler which takes away the heat in other words the oil which is draining out from the main engine after doing its work is led to a separate tank it is not in the, the same sump as the engine it is led to a separate tank this tank now has got hot oil okay this hot oil is then drawn by the pump through a strainer and then it is passed through a filter and then it is passed through the cooler so the hot oil which is much more fluid like he says the viscosity is lower yes it is lower for a hot oil so that hot oil passes through the filter easily because it is hot and the viscosity is less and then it passes through the cooler after it comes out from the cooler it is clean cooled oil and it is at 40 degree centigrade and then it goes to a main manifold from that manifold it goes to various parts of the main engine okay we'll come to that doing now you see he also says another thing a fine filter which filters particles of 50 microns this is a filter unit and it has got magnetic core which helps to remove any debris and traps ferrous particles for analysis the tubeness or plate type of lube oil cooler 
is cooled from low temperature central cooling water fresh water system and in some cases directly by sea water there's a lot of information packed into this i had no choice i had to put everything together otherwise the whole powerpoint becomes super long but every point has to be very clearly absorbed and understood okay now uh, you understood that the pump draws oil from the sump tank passes it through the filter and then passes it to the cooler and then it goes into the main engine okay now this filter on the there are huge filters the one is uh, each is about the size of me sometimes there are four filters sometimes there are two filters where there are four filters then two are in use two are standby if there are two filters then one is on standby one is in use and also there is a differential pressure transmitter which will sound the signal in case the filter is choking moment it is choking you are supposed to change over to the clean filter and get the dirty filter cleaned these are ordinary manually cleaned filters because you need to see what is the dirt that is inside that is the reason why you have manual filters over here if it was automatic it will just clean the dirt and the dirt will go into sludge tank and you will never know what dirt it was and you need to know what is the dirt that is coming inside the filter it is an indicative of your engine health condition okay now this filter apart from filtering the oil has a cover this cover on the underside has got magnetic blocks magnets now in the lube oil if there are any iron particles they get stuck to that magnet so when you remove the cover you are supposed to scrape off whatever iron powder or pieces it has collected and put it in a bottle and send it to the laboratory for analysis the laboratory will analyze it and it will tell you where those particles are coming from whether it is coming from your piston ring whether it is coming from your liner whether they are coming from your cam and roller whether they are coming from any part that is having metal to metal contact that is steel to steel and this quantity has a limitation say 0.001 gram per month is considered satisfactory if it exceeds the limit then there is something wrong something seriously wrong with your engine and the major mess up will take place after some time so this is means of identifying what fault is there in the engine now suppose you get a particle a steel particle and you don't know what it is on the ship you cannot tell where this iron mess is coming from in the laboratory they have macro microscopic examinations plus they have some specs all all very advanced i also don't know those procedures but they have very advanced procedures in identify where that particle is coming from if it is cast iron it could be nodular cast iron or flake graph or graphite cast iron they will decide and based on that type of cast iron they will decide whether it is piston ring or liner similarly for the forged steel the roller is of a different grade steel the cam is of a different grade steel they will identify whether it is the cam or the roller which steel is getting worn out so that is the way it is so they will identify the fault within the engine and let you know in that report okay and that is it the lube oil cooler tube nest okay now this cooling of the lubricating oil in all the ships that i have been in they are using sea water sea water for cooling the lube oil so the lube oil cooler i will show you a tube nest here i think you have already done it in your auxiliaries yeah now this is the tube nest all right type of a cooler the sea water enters from the bottom left side and there is a baffle plate so it cannot have a shot cut and go out from there so this baffle plate allows the oil to only pass through the tube i have shown the tubes only in the top half but actually the tubes are right through the entire nest what is here within this square or rectangular part is called the tube nest and what is outside is called the shell shell of the tube so that's why it is called shell and tube type so the tube nest basically has two plates on either on each end and the tubes are fitted in between and the tubes are passing through you know uh, not full circular plates but three quarter circular plates 
and these plates act as baffle plates. So what happens when the tube nest is fitted inside? It is sealed at this point and at this point and at this point and at this point, circular, so that whatever water goes in goes in only through the tube and comes out from that side and again re-enters. It makes a U-turn over here and comes out from the tube to come out from there. And the lubricating oil, the hot lubricating oil is sent from the bottom. It fills up this whole space. Then it takes a high jump and goes over the baffle plate. Then it comes out here and it fills up again and again takes a jump here. So it goes round and round this and then goes out. This makes the maximum use of the surface area of contact to provide for maximum heat transfer. And the heat is collected by the seawater to be dispelled outside. And the lube oil gets cooled and then it proceeds up to the engine. So, where is it? Okay. So, that is what it says. The lube oil cooled from low temperature center. Now, in the modern ships, they avoid using seawater. I don't, I don't, I have not seen any of them. But I think it is quite a tricky business. Why? Because to get the temperature of the lube oil down to 40 degrees centigrade, only seawater can perform. Because seawater can cool fresh water. And then fresh water will cool the lube oil. It's very difficult to get that temperature gradient to 40 degrees centigrade. Because the seawater itself is about 31 degrees centigrade. So, very small margin. If the seawater is supposed to cool fresh water and that fresh water is going to cool the lubricating oil, then it is very, very tough to get that lube oil down to 40 degrees centigrade. But they have got it, which means the fresh water cool coolers are gigantic in nature. They must be having gigantic coolers in the present day ships. So that is how the lubricating oil system works. Now here I have the main engine lube oil system and there are four different routes to this. So let us find out how this diagram is very small here. So I will try to get a bigger diagram by opening this one. Okay. Now here I have got a bigger diagram which should be able to be visible. Can you boys see it? Paran? Paran, are you able to see this diagram? The diagram? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. This is the biggest I can make. But with the link, I will send you this diagram separately so you can study it further. Okay. Now let's have a quick look at it. Now here you have the main engine. All right. And the main engine, whatever lubrication is happening inside, the lube oil falls to the bottom. And once it falls to the bottom, I have made three openings here, but these three openings are not really in this transverse section. These three openings around the longitudinal section of the engine at the forward mode path, at the mid position part, and the aft mode path. But since I have not shown you the engine in the longitudinal position, I have shown you three different points on the engine from where the oil is drained out from the engine sump. So remember, the three points are actually in the longitudinal direction, not in the transverse direction. This is only figurative. So once the oil comes in, it comes into the tank. The tank also has been shown in the longitudinal direction. If I were to show you in the transverse section, it would just amount to be a rectangle. And I wouldn't be able to show you all these details here. The tank itself is not touching the double bottom, that means the point at the uh, bottommost part of the hull. It is not touching, it is way above. This is a, a little lower than the tank top, little lower than the tank top. Okay. Now this tank, what you see as the sump tank, is got a, diff is got a gradient. So at point, this is the aft part of the tank and this is the forward part of the tank. So if you were to turn the tank in the longitudinal direction of the engine, this would be in the forward part, this would be in the astern part. All right. And this whole system has four different circuits. There are four different circuits over here. The first circuit, let us consider the first circuit which is related to the main engine. The oil is drawn from the lower level of the tank 
because this is the level where the clean oil is the dirt the water everything it will gradually go down to this part of the tank where the purifier will draw the oil and for cleaning your kidneys these are your kidneys so the main engine by itself has got two separate helical gear pumps which will draw the oil through a strainer and pump it through the filter these are fine filters and they can separate particles up to 50 microns thereafter that hot oil proceeds to the cooler the lube oil cooler allows the oil to be cooled to 40 degrees centigrade after it comes out from there it goes to a common manifold a manifold means a common pipe from this common pipe you see there are branches a b c d e what are they a goes to main bearing and vibration damper b goes to camshaft bearings c goes to reversing mechanism d goes to thrust bearing e goes to piston pulling so there are several parts of the engine that the lube oil goes to and i can't show you other it will be a mess over here so i have given it as a b c d it is easy for you to remember also and easy for you to put it down as a list in the exam another two pipes are there one pipe goes directly to a tank a overhead tank this tank is about 1 meter by 1 meter by 1 meter usually it can be a little bigger also and this tank fills up with lube oil the system the main pump itself pumps the oil right into the tank it has a filling pipe and it fills the tank of course it's a covered tank and also from the tank you have a pipe at the bottom which goes to the turbocharger so the oil which is filling the tank ultimately reaches the turbocharger there is one difference this pipe which is going to the turbocharger is fitted with a with a, uh, a orifice a plate orifice plate is a plate which is got a specific diameter hole drilled in it so that the oil flow is a little restricted so the restricted oil as per the requirement of the bearing is allowed to pass through that pipe and come to the turbocharger bearing after it lubricates and cools the bearing it proceeds further directly into the sump tank okay now because there is a restricted plate over here the rate of filling is more than the rate at which it is getting emptied out so in the process the tank will start filling up gradually and after about a few minutes the tank will start overflowing there is an overflow pipe also made for it and this pipe passes on onto a sight glass a sight glass is a glass where you can see that the oil is flowing through and behind the sight glass we usually put one bulb a lighted bulb so it improves your visibility of the oil falling through because you see oil is almost black in color the cranky oil so something black is very difficult to discern to see that so if you put a light at the back then you can see that oil is little brownish black so you can make out that the oil is flowing after it passes it actually there it there is a switch over here a electric switch and this switch is activated to give a signal to the control room that you can start your engine if that switch does not get activated you cannot start your engine so this switch ensures that the turbocharger gets oil before you start the engine without fail so then after that the oil goes back into the sump okay so this is one circuit a second circuit is mm. the oil is taken from this bell mouth here at the deeper end of the tank taken to the purifier by the purifier pump and then it is pumped through the heater that heater allows the oil to come up to 75 to 80 degree centigrade which is considered to be the ideal temperature for separation of dirt water from the lube oil so then it goes into the lube oil it is purified as a centrifuge works it comes out from the centrifuge and then it goes back into the sump and it is dropped at the cleaner section of the tank all right the aft section is considered as the dirty part of the oil cleaner section as the forward part of course if the ship is pitching and rolling and all that then all that doesn't make much of a difference 
but as far as practicable they try to give clean oil to the pump and to the main engine so this is the second circuit a third circuit is the pump allows the oil to be pumped directly into another tank which is called the dirty oil tank all right if the oil is contaminated if the oil has got a lot of water in it the oil and water mixture is sent into the dirty oil tank once the dirty oil tank is full up they stop that stop the pump and then they start running the purifier so the purifier draws oil from the dirty oil tank instead of the sump the respective valves are closed and then it draws that oil from the dirty oil tank and here it comes here by the pump and then it goes to the heater and is pumped in and then what comes out is again sent back to the dirty oil tank so from the dirty oil tank to the dirty oil tank continuous procedure is followed till such time the oil is cleared cleaned out once it is cleaned out then it can be opened and discharged back into the sump after opening the respective valves okay so this pumping of the oil from the sump tank to the dirty oil tank by the main engine pump can be done and so can it be done by the pump of the purifier also okay so these are separate circuits which are used and that's how it works okay so that we all for today it is 11:06 already and i think that will be all for today so we are going to close class now i will need the attendance right now so let us go on to our attendance any questions if you have any questions do ask me and i shall immediately clarify the uh if you don't understand Oh, you got some questions. Okay, let's go back to chat. Yeah, where are the questions? Okay, put down your names so that I can see. Oh, all the numbers are all haywire. Let me see in this one. Thirty-six. It should be forty. So there are four absentees. Ah, uh, how many withdrawn? Paran, how many withdrawn in this class? Sir, two, zero two. 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 So two. Let us add thirty-eight. So that means two are absent. And then two. Who are who are these two who are absent? Let's check up. Let's see people. Okay. Um, eight zero seven eight. Who is eight zero seven nine missing? Eight zero eight one. Eight two is missing. Okay. Eight one eight three eight. Himan Himanish Mukherjee, what's your number? So eight four sir. Eight four, okay. Eight four is there. Eight three, eight four, eight five, eight six, eight seven, eight seven. Jatin, you have put your number twice. Eight seven, eight seven, eight eight. Jayant Kumar Gorai, what's your number? Nine zero. Eight, so eight nine is missing. Eight nine is withdrawn, sir. Withdrawn, sir. Okay. Actually, what happens when I put the attendance? It is already marked withdrawn. So let it be written. Don't worry. It will be marked. Eight nine is withdrawn. So nine one. Where is nine two? Nine two. Okay, nine two is not there. Nine three nine four. Ah, uh, Karutharan Ashwin. What's your number? Nine five. Nine five, sir. Okay, nine, nine six. Five. Okay. Ah, uh, nine six. Nine seven. Nine eight. Now Khalid Yaya Ahmed. What's your number? Nine seven. Nine seven. Yes, sir. Nine seven. So nine eight is missing. Nine eight nine nine one hundred and Kundan Kumar Sharma, are you eight zero zero one? So one zero two, sir. One zero two. So one zero one is missing. One zero one is missing. Two, three, four, five, six, six. Then Manish Kumar Yadav, eight zero eight one zero seven, right? Yes, sir. I'm one zero seven, sir. Okay, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve is there. Ah, uh, Mitunjay Kumar Rana. What's your number? One four, sir. One four. So eight one three is missing. One three is missing. One four is there. Five six seven. Okay. The last man, last girl, is Neha Sathi. Okay. That will be all. So I have the numbers. I'm calling out. These are the absentees or withdrawn. Eight zero seven nine. Eight zero eight two, 